Recycle Week from the 12th to the 17th, London Recycle will be hosting a series of events to promote repairs and extension of the life uh, of the, the things that we use. I'm Hasna Korda, founder and CEO of Save Your Wardrobe. We are a digital platform reconnecting our community to the content of their wardrobe uh, through an ecosystem of services uh, like eco-friendly dry cleaning, donation, repairs, and more generally anything related to wardrobe management. Jumping into the topic of this session, uh, London Recycle has launched for the first time ever London Repair Week. And for this event, they've uh, commissioned a new research ahead, um, ahead of time that has revealed that Londoners are eager to repair and reuse things, with over two thirds uh, stating that they would repair more of their household items and possession if they know how. And uh, from those uh, two thirds, 40% stated that they didn't know who uh, would repair their, uh, their items. So today I will be joined by a stellar partner, uh, panel to discuss how behaviors are shifting and accelerating towards mindful consumption, or probably more relevant to call it responsible citizenship. Um, it is important to also uh, put in, at the center of this panel uh, the COVID-19 crisis, which happens in a climate emergency context. And, uh, and I believe that it has been uh, a catalyst for systemic change and proactivism. Repairing has become a civic action and more and more younger generations are upskilling themselves and learning ways to make new with old. Proof of this is the growing popularities of apps like Depop, where, uh, where Gen Zs uh, have been able to monetize their skills and creativity. To discuss more in depth, I'm joined uh, today with experts and professionals of the industry. We will talk about how the COVID recession has accelerated sustainable practices, uh, digital transformation, uh, in a world where contactless is the new norm and how responsible citizenship is taking over traditional capitalism consumerism. Um, so today I have Dr. Catherine Duffy, Ludovic Blanc and Paul uh, Kenwick, is that right? Paul? Correct, Kenwick, yeah. Ken <laughs> Dr. Catherine Duffy is a lecturer in marketing in the Adam Smith Business School, University of Glasgow. Her research expertise is in consumer culture uh, with a particular interest in the digitalization of consumption and secondhand consumption. Ludovic is founder of C and CEO of Blanc. Blanc is a sustainable garment care specialist offering an expert non-toxic alternative to conventional dry cleaning alongside tailoring and laundry services. And Paul uh, is the co-founder and managing director of Shoe Spa and Back Spa. He's a serial entrepreneur with, with an extensive experience in finance, travel and the fashion industry as a general. Thank you so much everyone for taking the time out of your schedule and joining me to delve into the future of the fashion industry through the lens of aftercare behaviors. Um, maybe as a start, we can take a minute and for each of you to, uh, to share a little bit more about your work and, uh, and how you started uh, your businesses. So maybe uh, Kat, uh, you can go first. Sure. Uh, thank you so much for the really warm welcome, Hasna. It's nice to see everybody this afternoon. Um, as Hasna said, my work focuses on consumer culture and specifically I'm interested in how consumers navigate and manage their clothing consumption. And that ranges all the way through from vintage items into more luxury investment pieces. Um, myself and my colleague, Professor Deirdre Shaw, have been working with the Save Your Wardrobe team for almost two years, I believe now, um, since meeting at Copenhagen Fashion Summit. We had been interested in how consumers could be more mindful and more conscious of their clothing consumption. And it seemed like we had great synergy with the guys at Save Your Wardrobe in terms of their aspirations for the app. Um, we have carried out research with Save Your Wardrobe looking at how consumers feel about their wardrobes, um, how they would see a kind of digital intervention in terms of helping them address some of the anxieties that they associated with their clothing and really how they could get more joy um, from what they already own. 
repair and care and maintenance is something that we keep seeing over and over again as a key theme coming out of our research. And this has been especially true over the past six months um, as repair and kind of focusing on what we already own and deriving happiness and joy from that has become something that I think is so important to so many consumers, especially as we start to consider life at some point post COVID, which we're all hoping to get to. Okay. Yeah, very much hoping that. Uh, maybe Ludovic, you can uh, share because yeah, because you and Paul have a, a background in finance, so it would be nice to, <laughs> to show us the transition from uh, from That's that right. to, to aftercare. Thank you very much, Asta, for for welcoming us. Uh, I'm delighted to be on this panel this afternoon and talked about. Repair and recycle, which is very close to our heart at, at Blanc. Uh, so yeah, we are an eco-friendly dry cleaners and tailors, and I would say that maintaining the clothes uh, is right into our DNA. It's about making them last long, uh, whether we clean them without toxic products or whether we repair them. And that's really what, what we do on a daily basis, uh, what, we, what we've done uh, since creation and what, what we do more and more. Uh, so we have now, uh, 50 people in our team, um, and we we uh, take care of uh, approximately a thousand items a day, um, and and clearly, um, uh, yeah, the, the essence of it is to make sure that these items can uh, last longer. Uh, uh, whether it's about the cleaning, the tailoring, and they go through a very wide range of from the most delicate to the most basic items. I think we we work both with um, B 2 C and with B2B as, as well, a number of luxury brands uh, in, in that cleaning. Uh, personally, I started um, Blanc eight years ago, uh, yeah, working in, in, in finance before, uh, really because I wanted to uh, set up a business who would have a, a very positive impact and, and change something and environment and health are very close to my heart. And I look at this sector, which I found amazing, the cleaning of the clothes, the maintenance, uh, which everybody wear, but no one really has a deep look into it, and yet it is extremely toxic. Uh, and also uh, small changes can make the clothes last longer and save lots of landfill and save lots of toxicity. So that's why uh, I jumped into the sector very unexpectedly uh, eight years ago. And since then I've been um, very happy and I'm quite happy to be on this panel today and shows the importance actually of, of the general clothes maintenance sector. So really delighted to be in this conversation. Happy to have you as well. Over to you, Paul. All right, thank you very much. I'm Paul Kanyog. Uh, thank you for arranging the whole panel. So my background, just like Ludovic's, is in finance. I arrived to London five years ago from Amsterdam. Um, and actually, I noticed first on myself that there is a need of proper comprehensive solution for shoes, especially in London with a humid weather. Well, we use underground public transport quite often. The shoes, especially the leather shoes, are being damaged quite frequently. I was looking myself for a proper solution, as obviously I don't want to buy a new pair every month or so. Um, and because I realized that there are not many options, not many choices, I decided to set up Shoes Spa first, which was naturally followed by, by Bike Spa. Uh, so we, have offer, we offer services for comprehensive for shoe restoration, but also customization, and the same for, for handbags. Uh, so the, the need, the customer need, that was the first driver, but of course there is much more behind it because I, we will definitely touch base regarding the sustainability uh, during this conference today. But there are also reasons like, like cost cutting, like certain sentiment customers have towards their shoes and towards their handbags. So there are different reasons uh, why Customers are looking for this kind of solution, but there is definitely a huge need. And I see that the market is growing, the awareness is growing. People are, just like we discussed, people are willing to participate and to, to, to use those kind of services regarding their shoes, handbags, but also clothing in general. But they're not often clear on where to go, how to do it, etc. So I think the awareness is the key, and that's what I hope we can also achieve uh, through, through this discussion. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much, everyone, for this uh, intro. Um, I'd love to start the, the, the panel discussion with, uh, we can't actually really ignore and we can't start it without addressing the current global context and pandemic 
And I would love to, to, to talk and have your views on the impact of the COVID-19 on uh, the industry or businesses and the overall uh, sustainability angle. Um, so a question for you, Kat, to start. Um, so you led several research on consumer behaviors and your focus is always sustainability. How did you see the behavioral changes over the year and how this particular health crisis has impacted a traditional consumption? Um, 2020, I think it's definitely been an interesting year. I think for consumers, it's really given almost this kind of enforced pause for people where people have started to reflect on what's important to them individually, their health, their family, their safety, turning towards their local community. And I think in amongst all of the huge challenges and hurdles that we've all faced as individuals this year, we have seen people start to reconnect with nature to find this really as kind of restorative opportunity. And I think that has impacted on people's sustainability aspirations. In terms of clothing, our research this year has seen people start to reconnect with what they already own. Um, and thinking about how they use what they already own, the quality of the materials, how they care for their garments. Um, but we've also seen people start to consider things like more capsule wardrobes because people have been existing with much less. We've had people telling us about how they feel overwhelmed by what they own. And actually the pause of the past few months has allowed people the space to actually start to think about what they own, how they treat it, whether it's making them happy or not. And I think for a lot of people, they've had that impetus to keep buying new somewhat removed because we haven't been in our day-to-day -day routines. So I think people have been able to take time and to question about what they're buying and what they're bringing into their homes. So I think it's been a really interesting time from that perspective to see people almost reshop their wardrobe. And that's something that we've seen with Save Your Wardrobe and all of the auxiliary services that people want to make the most out of what they already own and are generally thinking much more about what they're going to add potentially into their wardrobe. That's definitely something that we that we were able to see as well. Uh, this and, and maybe it's also that re uh, reconnection with your home and what you have in a general sense. Since you are since we are all con uh, we've been confined for a while, so the the things that we get to 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 to, to do are uh, about the home. So moving on to to Paul and Ludovic, this is a question for both of you. Um, so both the, of your uh, services are available on the on Save Your Wardrobe app and so we were able to, to see during lockdown that uh, the inc there was an increase and in growth of service requests by 400%. Uh, so that was uh, an incredible uh, growth that we were able to see. Uh, and People were actively decluttering and rediscovering what they have at, uh, in their home, just like uh, Kat mentioned. Um, once lockdown has lifted, have you been able to see any changes in the services uh, requested, in the type of services, or did you feel like clients have been requesting more uh, of another set of services, maybe things that they could get to do by themselves at home? So you want your... to <laughs> Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, it's difficult in such a period to distinguish what are all the drivers. So I think I'll mention some of the drivers that, that we've seen uh, and try and draw conclusions from that. I think, uh, first of all, uh, clearly there's been much more a focus on digital. So going online, of course, people couldn't go to stores. So we've seen an explosion in, uh, in home deliveries. Uh, during that period, which is staying now. So people have changed some habits and, and our business is way more in terms of uh, home deliveries. Um, in terms of the habits as well, we did see a, a big, big increase in uh, charity donations during the period. So people, as you say, have basically been going through all their wardrobe and sorted things out. So we've been helping by taking things, giving them to charity. And then the new routine has started after uh, after the lockdown, and I would say there was two phases. To me, there was a phase up to end of August, 
we still a lot of people were a bit in semi-lockdown mode or holidays or and then yeah. from September, which I think is the not the new normal, nothing is normal and we don't know exactly where we're going, but uh, kind of two phase. And I think during the first phase after the lockdown, lockdown um, we definitely saw a big surge in repairs. So tailoring activities, we, we have six tailors uh, and gradually, uh, I think mid-summer, we, we've launched these services, we've relaunched it and it's picked up a lot. So definitely people had been preparing things uh, as Kat was saying that they liked, that they didn't really know what to do before because it was so easy to uh, basically buy a new one or be attracted by a new product when, when shopping around. But there was not so much this temptation. And in conjunction with that, there was, you know, probably this reflection of what can I do with my wardrobe and also at a deeper level, what can I do to, to save money and what can I do to not uh, consume uh, like I used to do. And based on that, we've seen a lot of, um, uh, of, of, of requests for repairing. And we used to do a lot of repairing in the sense that you buy a dress, it's too short or too long, we do that repair. But we've seen much less of that, but much more of repairing of old, not old, you know, um, things that you had in your wardrobe for a while. Uh, and in terms of the cleaning, we indeed have seen um, way more than for cleaning of household items. So sofa covers, uh, curtains, anything around the house. Um, and of course, less uh, suits and classical party dress because there is much less. So uh, the other trend that we've seen is an increase in uh, laundry services. So things that, uh, of course, you're not going to wear your best suit at the moment because you are only going to have a Zoom a week. Uh, so way less shirts and, uh, and suits and, and party dress. However, some people, although you are able to do the laundry at home, people have realized the magnitude of the, of the work to do. And so that this is something that with the digitalization, with the on home delivery, why don't I outsource this part of my uh, core um, of paying for tax to someone? So the, the mix of products that we've offered has moved, some going more to the repair and some more and more to the to the convenience that people have thought, well, why don't I outsource this task as opposed to, to do it myself? Yeah, yeah, totally. And what about you, Paul? Yeah, so I think that the experience is pretty similar. Well, our businesses are quite similar. So first of all, it's, well, COVID was not great for businesses in general with some ex exceptions. However, uh, it's, we, can, we can see some positive trends, right? And I guess we all can all learn from the new normal, new current normal and, and think of what, what are the, what are the new options? What can we change for better? So definitely they, we have a huge increase of online. Our business, although we have a physical store in King's Cross, but it's almost entirely online at this moment. It's both convenience, but people just don't travel that much to the city centers mm -hmm. for obvious reasons, right? Um, another change which we notice is there's less of like accidental damage, like someone went out for a party and the shoes or handbag were stained. It's more like, actually people scanning their wardrobes, checking what they actually have at home, thinking a little bit more long-term of, mm -hmm. oh, I have this, this, this pair of shoes, I haven't used it for so long, simply because I didn't like the color. Maybe now it's, a, sorry, maybe now it's actually a, change to, a ch chance to, to change that. So I think it's more like from this accidental short-term, there's a bit more of a long-term planning, that's first thing. Second of all, I think the mindset is changing and that will definitely take months, if not years, but people are actually thinking, okay, well, there is certain crisis on the, on the planet. What, what should I think about it? Maybe we should all try to be a bit more sustainable, think about the environment, think about our interaction. And I think longer term, that will impact the patterns more in the sense there'll be less buying, like constant buying, buying, but actually thinking, okay, maybe I can, I can just use the items I already have, just change them, improve them, uh, refresh them even. Uh, so I think that the mindset is, is changing and this, this whole crisis actually accelerates certain processes. Uh, so th these are definitely the positives. Plus, as I said, the use of online and, and technology in general, it, it's all accelerated the, the, the way users interact with us, the way they, they order services, the perception ch changed, uh, which I think is great. That just creates a lot of new opportunities for everyone to explore it and, 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 and to support those needs. Okay. Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing your, your view on what's happening on the daily basis in, in your businesses and uh, 
it's uh, it's always incredible to see how uh, this kind of uh, global experiences impacts in a local uh, at a local level. Um, so actually, I, I want to go back to, by the way, anyone who has a question, uh, feel free to use the chat or the Q&A uh, feature on Zoom, and uh, we will uh, respond to those uh, at the end of the panel. We have 20, about 20 minutes dedicated for Q&A. So um, yeah, I wanted to go back to, uh, to the general feel that you have uh, about the, the, the relationship of a recession and, uh, and the change for good uh, in terms of co co consumption and aftercare behaviors more, as in, do you feel like uh, people are willing to, to take those repairs themselves? Or uh, as you mentioned, uh, Ludovic, it's more, uh, they, they need someone to, to do it for them. Um. I think it's, it's really a mix. I think, gen I think it's a mix of what generally the need for repair and maintenance is growing massively. And mm -hmm. not only are I think people now are going through their wardrobe, but I think in the future, what I'm starting to perceive is that people are going to buy more expensive items. Because mm -hmm. uh, when you're going to buy, you're going to do a sort of a, a lifelong calculation thinking, mm -hmm. am I going to buy this 50 pound jumper or am I going to invest a bit more? And I know I've got the repair around. To do it. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, personally, I'm doing it with electric goods now, and I have a choice to buy a, a washing machine at home. In the office, something different. Um, <laughs> but you're starting to factor this, and I know in in many other industries there's no repair. I mean, you have a, a washing machine broken, you struggle to find someone reliable around to extend the life. I think in our with the clothes, people are a bit more aware. So I, I can see and sense a trend with customers to buy better products. And when we discuss with manufacturers as well, fashion brands, they are all now very focused on, uh, I mean, when I say all, a lot of people we speak to on making their own clothes um, more sturdy, more, more long-term, which in the past was not really a concern, on the contrary, sometimes. Uh, but in terms of whether people do it themselves or not, I think there's been a big, I mean, it's fantastic. People have, have relearned to do things themselves, uh, mm -hmm. which is great. Um, but there is, in the magnitude of people, there is also a lot of people who anyway won't have time, they are looking for solutions. So I think it's a bit of both. And in fact, we've had a lot of requests and we are kind of, kind of doing some um, um, teaching to teach our customers as well how to do it themselves. So we also, uh, as long as things happen, it's good. And I think we should all push for people to learn how to do it. Yeah. And I think when people learn how to do it, they also learn how difficult it can be, um, the value more the service, and then if they can do it, it's fantastic. The day they don't have the time or the material, then they can answer to a professional. But the trend towards doing it themselves for everybody, I think is fantastic. It's reappropriating the know-how mm -hmm. and the knowledge and the product. When you spend half an hour trying to sew a button on your jumper, you love your jumper more. <laughs> <laughs> totally. And actually, this is a, a great transition for Kata. I'm, I'm seeing you nodding, and uh, I'm sure that you have some insights on the research about this upskilling trends and people wanting to feel empowered by, um, with, uh, with their own uh, hands. Uh, mm, very much so. So I would agree with Ludwig. I think the, the ideas of, of repair and care and maintenance are really multifaceted. And I think for a lot of mainstream consumers, it is a skill set that they don't have anymore in terms of sewing on a button or darning and mending. And unfortunately, that has been lost over generations. So I do think there is an education piece there in terms of sewing and repair and at home simple fixes. But I think as Ludovic says, for a lot of consumers, they're time poor and they're looking for a solution that's going to be efficient um, that's going to be convenient for them and is a way for them to clean and take care of their clothes in a way that reflects the initial investment that they've made into that piece. So I think we see repair really emerging across a kind of spectrum of consumers where people do want to be able to do the easy quick wins with a piece of clothing to really extend the life of that garment but also as we see people buying more second hands and buying vintage they need to have the opportunity to make those pieces really to fit them and to fit within 
the kind of other objects that they already own and really to tailor it to their personality. And there I think repair also has a huge role to play in terms of really keeping those items going for longer and meaning more to the people that do own them at that moment in time before they're hopefully pushed on again in their life cycle. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, uh, we'll actually, this is an, a, such an exciting topic that we will, uh, we will dedicate a whole part at the, uh, just before closing the, 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 the discussion. But first, um, I wanted to touch point on something that both uh, Paul and Ludovic mentioned. Uh, it's the digital acceleration, uh, and I'm sure that people are relying to those uh, to those digital content to upskill themselves and educate themselves as well. So, um, in an industry that is traditionally very physical and uh, offline um, and local, uh, where both of your business models are actually heavily enabled by tech uh, by technology. How do you think this will influence consumer towards more sustainable practices? So you mentioned that the, the orders are done uh, online more and more, the pickup and uh, the contactless part. Do you feel like in the long run, this will completely change uh, the relationship that uh, people have with their local uh, workshop, dry cleaner or artisan? Well, Paul speaking here, I, I definitely think that's the case. Um, it's, of course, a bit unfortunate to the traditional industry because I think all the, all the new could coexist. But at this moment, people just stop going to the city centers. Uh, you know, usually that traditionally they were visiting their cobras on their way to the office in the morning and picking up their, their, their shoes, for instance, the next day or, or the day after. And this just, this just completely stopped. Uh, I, I'm in touch with some, you know, traditional cobblers just to, to see how, how it's going. And, and I think that the, the transformation actually moves much faster than everyone was thinking, just like say a couple of months ago. It's, it's just happening. It's just it's, it's clearly this convenience factor that is decisive here. But of course, because you mentioned the technology, there is much more to that because the technology that not only means convenience, thanks to the te technology, we can also explain much better what is possible, show multiple examples, uh, present these short videos, explaining the process, uh, showing options, basically educate people. And I think that that can further accelerate the, the transformation and also the, the create the additional awareness because in most of the cases, people still don't know how much the technology actually can do about their, their apparels, their, their, their handbags, et cetera. And that's also changing, of course, the technology is moving some progress each and every year. And thanks to, again, thanks to new communication tools, we can, we can keep all the potential customers up to date and uh, in the loop. So I think the technology plays a huge role here. I also wanted to add one more thing. So we were discussing this vintage items. Um, so shoes by and bags by historically were focusing on designer and, and high quality, uh, more expensive uh, market segments, simply because those services are quite time consuming and, and they cost quite a lot. Of course, again, technology will probably help him here lower the cost in the future. But at this moment, we restore quite a lot of designer vintage items. And you notice that sometimes customers actually treat not only their Hermès and Chanel handbag, but also their pair of trainers as a, some sort of investment. So people very often buy a vintage item simply because it's unique, discontinued, it has this unique character. And then they ask us actually to restore it. So it, it's still a vintage item, but back to a good condition. And they either use it or they can even just store it as, as <laughs> in their collection. So that, that's also, I think, quite a new trend, which is already coming here. and perhaps the, the crisis accelerated it again. Yeah, that's for sure. Uh, it's, uh, it's uh, those who've survived have been the more tech enabled and, uh, and moving to, to, to you, Ludovic, I know that you have one store that in Marylebone or Mayfair that is fully tech, uh, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. So, so that's probably have helped a lot during lockdown. <laughs> We have a store where in Maribon, yes, where yeah. uh, our customers can drop off and collect uh, contactless. And yeah. this is our first mm -hmm. store. So this is wow. a store. That, um, I mean, we still have people in here. It's our, our busiest store, but we do have a system to drop off and collect 24 7 and, and without any contact. Absolutely. I think, uh, I mean, as much as the online has been growing a lot and we are pushing the digital aspect a lot, I'll come back to that. 
we still believe in the digital experience. So in our trade, uh, we do believe that um, we are a bit of a, a middle, middle stage where uh, for most of the routine, uh, people prefer the home delivery or business deliveries. Uh, but we still believe that our stores have a real uh, significance and a real uh, value added to the customers for when they need sort of the expert advice. Um, and, our, and that means, you know, if you have that stain or that tailoring that you need a fitting. Uh, so we still believe in, in, in both. And I think both bring different things. Uh, in one case, you will go uh, in the store to have this very specific advice that you couldn't have online but you may go there once a month and all the rest of the months you will use the technology to get with the flow um, and generally i would agree that uh, i mean in terms of sustainability which was back to your question i think the digitalization enables i think a to provide more services and explain more services as paul was saying so we can explain to our customers what we can do for them and the repair and how is an illustration that you can make a shirt uh, if the color is damaged you can make it a mouse shirt so showing examples that that clearly helps and makes the whole experience easier so that it's not that difficult when you have something from your wardrobe if you have to walk to a store and try and explain to someone then at the moment you can take a picture send it to us on whatsapp and get a quote that's just going to make people much more keen to use a, uh, a maintenance or, or a repair and the other thing about technology is that it, it reaches more people and that's something that you know um, if we had only stores you're only targeting a, a defined perimeter although people come from from far away at times but with with the online um, you can target a much uh, bigger perimeter and so you then multiply the little impact that you can have on physically so if you're, you're targeting all of london uh, or the whole of the UK with mail to order, um, then that little impact, because let, let's, I think we need to uh, be true to ourselves. It's about little impacts that we do every day. Uh, and uh, there is Pierre Rabhi in France who uh, calls it the, the colibri effect. It's like a little bird mm -hmm. want to switch off uh, a fire by just dropping a little drop of water. And everybody's telling him, this little bird, what are you doing? This is useless. And he's saying, look, I'm doing my beats, one drop at a time. What are yeah. you doing? And sometimes I reflect on that and we're not changing the world overnight, but it's about every repair, every close, if we extend six months to a year, uh, every time we clean something without that toxic solvent, or then it's a little, it's a little drop of water um, on top of the fire. And so by, by explaining more services and offering it to more people, that technology is really offering that to me. Mm. I love that analogy, rather poetic analogy with the hummingbird and uh, mm -hmm. and that little drop that with everyone doing that, uh, the, the impact will be uh, will be greater and uh, it ties really well with uh, with our next chapter, next part. But just before that, I wanted to ask you, Kat, a question about your. So we are for the the, the audience. Uh, so you know. We conducted a joint partnership on digitalizing sustainable fashion consumption with now about 50 of our users, beta testers and users. Um, so you have a great perspective on how digitalization have accelerated uh, sustainable consumption. Can you tell us a little bit more about it? Sure. Um, so our research really showed that people in terms of their clothing behaviors didn't have enough data to be able to make meaningful changes that aligns with their sustainability values. So when we were working with the beta testers, they really saw that a digital device, a digital intervention, such as the Save Your Wardrobe app, was a way for them to gain an understanding of what they already owned, what they were doing with those clothes, and then to have an understanding if they were going to buy something, what the potential impact of that was in terms of value or cost per wear, how it would fit with their inventory of clothing that they already had. And digitalization for our participants in the studies really was a way to feel more empowered, to have more agency around making decisions. And they compared it to other devices like Fitbits or an Apple Watch, which they used in terms of their health behaviors, their fitness behaviors. But we saw people really feeling anxious and overburdened by their clothes, 
but almost suffering from some kind of paralysis around they'd had their awareness raised. But we know from previous research that if consumers have their awareness raised, they need to have a kind of clear pathway to action. They need to have somewhere to go with that awareness that allows them to action it in a way that makes sense. So I think that's where we see digitalization really having an opportunity to help people, to assist people, to make those more sustainable choices or to live, um, to allow people to live according to their value sets that they do have. Um, so that's where I'm really excited to see digitalization flourish in terms of helping consumers. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Uh, a lot of these consumers are taking more control of their consumption and probably the, the feeling, the staying at home has uh, increased that need or that awareness about uh, the, the way they consume and the way they purchase things. And um, I'd love to, to go a little bit more uh, in depth into this subject and, uh, and, and go through the, our last theme of the, of the panel discussion, responsible citizenship or responsible hummingbird. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> no, I, love, uh, I love the way you described it, uh, Ludovic. And also I remember uh, for the, the preparation call, you, you've stated that convenience has become a necessity um, and not a luxury anymore. Um, maybe before going back to you, Ludovic, I have a question for you, Kat. Uh, so again, you have this incredible position where you are able to see that, where the, 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 the consumption is going, and you mentioned, uh, you've explained a lot already uh, about this taking back control, upskilling, uh, empowering themselves with, uh, with skills, ancestral skills from their grandparents or even from uh, YouTube. Um, I'd love to, for you to, to tell us if you feel like there is a proactivism, a, go, uh, like a, a kind of using con, a kind of consumerism into a new way of uh, being responsible and, uh, and acting uh, in, a, in a more responsible society. Um, well, I think, first of all, the ideas of responsible citizenship are really important given the current climate. So we're living in times of climate emergency, and I don't think that's something we can ignore. I think there is a much more prominent discourse from media and from social media specifically around the issues associated with the fashion system. And I think mainstream fashion consumers are starting to become more aware of those issues. Not all consumers, but I think there, is, there has been a growth in that discourse. I think I'm always hesitant to put a full emphasis on consumers in terms of responsibility because consumers as we've said, are overstretched and time poor and to some extent have limited capacity for action. But I think that's where making it as easy for people as possible to live their values, to really align their, sustain their sustainability goals and how they're treating their clothes together becomes really important. And I think that's right across the spectrum of consumption. So in terms of acquisition and use, but as we're talking about today, that care and maintenance phase, right through to disposal channels. And that's where I think it's really heartening that there has been such a growth in rental and resale. Um, but we also do need to see infrastructural changes in terms of recycling and making that something that's easy and available with really clear messaging for consumers. Um, but I think the idea of the, the best wardrobe that you can have is the one you already own um, and allowing people to really build on that investment that they've made in terms of their wardrobe. So as Ludwig spoke to the point earlier of buying less but buying better and then maintaining it, I think is almost a kind of individual activism that hopefully we can all indulge in to different varying degrees. Um, and for me, I think that encapsulates the kind of current moves around responsible citizenship to go back to the hummingbirds and what we can all do <laughs> on an individual basis. That's going to be the theme coming out of the panel now. Oh, we'll rename it the hummingbird. <laughs> <laughs> 
Amazing. Uh, thank you so much, Kat. This is it's extremely important to know where where the trend is going and uh, and and enabling consumers or social uh, activists, uh, responsible uh, citizens into uh, taking the lead in, in, uh, in that repair, uh, re uh, recycle, uh, upcycling and, uh, and not waiting for the, the, the laws or anything like that to, uh, to empower them. Um, moving on to you, Ludovic, uh, during our preliminary call, you mentioned that convenience has become a necessity and businesses had to answer to that need. Uh, are your customers asking for more uh, sustainable products or, or an easier way to, to access them? Yeah, it's very interesting because I think uh, the reason I was saying that is that uh, it's easy in, in, in our trade to consider that we can be craftsmen and we can clean very well without toxic product and repair perfectly, but um, there is a, an immense need for convenience. I, we, it's not enough to be just sustainable. Uh, mm -hmm. If if you are if if the use of your service or product is complicated, so uh, that's where I was saying that the convenience, like the home delivery, used to be can be perceived as a luxury. But today, most people are going to shop online for their weekly shopping, and the same for the um, for the cleaning. So. Uh, offering tools, not only digital tools, but physical tools that are going to enable the customer to make what we can call the right choice in terms of sustainability easy is paramount because if, because you're sustainable, you're not as easy to use as an alternative, then um, a lot of people are not going to make the change. So what we've been very, very much focused on since the beginning, but even accelerating is to make sure that Okay, now we know that our operations, you know, we don't use toxic product and we renew, but then how do we make sure that we are easy to use uh, by everybody? And so convenience is an absolute necessity. And we see that in many sectors. If um, you know, people are happy to have a great product, but don't make it easy for uh, yeah. consumers to get, uh, it, it doesn't work. So I, I see that as a, it's, it's, it's all the part about customer experience. Mm -hmm. uh, even if your product is sustainable, but it's ugly, you're only going to target a small part of the market, but why don't you make it sustainable and elegant if you're selling clothes, for example, or anything. So it has to be attractive. It has to be uh, long standing and, and all these box has to be ticked. So I think it makes business more difficult. And I think we've all find that, you know, uh, the more you add uh, constraints and you want to be sustainable and you want to be um, lasting long and pleasing your customer, it's more difficult, but I think it's, it's imperative. And this is something that has been even highlighted by, by this crisis that companies who are not doing all of this, uh, they cannot pick and choose, I'm being sustainable or I'm going to be convenient mm -hmm. and toxic. You need to be all of that. Otherwise, um, it's going to be way more difficult in, in the medium term because the, the, the time has been accelerated by 10 uh, over the past yeah. two months. That's, that's so true. Uh, even though we've been, we spent the past six months locked at home, the time flew. Uh, so fast and um, it's even more anxiety triggering in this context of climate uh, emergency um, and and it calls to to uh, to to a more scalable uh, to a larger scale uh, solution yeah. um, on this topic I want to say now we're talking a lot about the consumers but we see a lot of the businesses so all the businesses who are developing rental solutions, secondhand solutions, yeah. and all the fashion business, and we're working with a lot of them, uh, there is a missing bit here, which is what uh, Paul and I are doing, is that if you want to set up and maintain a large scale rental or secondhand or vintage, you need the people at the, at the middle who are going to be the craftsmen, mm -hmm. who are going to repair, maintain, clean, and, and be the little grease in the wheels of these big brands. And I think, um, that's what Paul is doing, I think that's what I'm doing, and combining the tech, when we speak to them, they say we found either craftsmanship without tech or tech companies without craftsmanship, and it's about combining both. Yeah. And uh, it is something that I hear is really missing, and I mean, of course, this is what we offer, but uh, we hope there will be more because there is a big need, and you can't, I found it with my washing machine at home, I couldn't find anyone to repair, so in our industry, we are doing it, there needs to be way more people who focus on on that part of the mm -hmm. of the of the cycle of the yeah. 
for the, the long term. Well. Yeah, it, uh, totally. You've actually answered the, the next question I had mm -hmm. about second hand market and uh, the growth of uh, secondary market. Uh, Paul, Paul, I no, it's okay, don't worry. Uh, Paul, I, uh, I know that you've expanded into Europe and uh, I guess this, it was also an answer to, to the, those growing uh, need, uh, that growing need for generated by, um, by the popularity of secondary market, right? Yeah, so I think perhaps I can touch two different subjects here, but both linked, of course. So first of all, I think we are quite fortunate to be in the UK. I think UK strictly was not always the number one country in the world when it comes to sustainability, but at least in my industry, in, in shoes and bags, we are definitely one of the global leaders. Leaders, It's a great place to be. And that's why we also decided to expand. So France is our first step, but surely not the last one. I think there's a huge need everywhere in Europe and even outside Europe for, for similar services. Uh, and customer needs are almost the same, right? And the, the other subject will link to that. So we're talking a lot about consumers here, right? Where, whereas the global presence or at least the European presence would definitely help us in our uh, relationship with the big brands. Because, you know, historically everyone was telling me, oh, what, whatever you do, the big brands like say Chanel, La Boutinva will never be in favor because, because of you, they will sell us. But I think it's not necessarily the case because Brands like 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 Chanel, La Boutin, they, they also would like the customers to be happy. Not only happy when they buy the item, that's always you know huge inflow of endorphins, but also one two three months later, once the item perhaps it's a little bit scratched or damaged, and that's I think that's the aftercare when those brands actually show they, they care about their customers not only at the beginning in the shop but also subsequently. That's creating confidence. And that's also, I think, helping those brands, not only their image, but it's also helping them because if they take good care of their customer, this customer will come back. And I think they, are, they really start understanding it. And that's why I think they will be more and more willing to cooperate with companies like us, but with any, any companies you know, supporting the sustainable lifestyle and prolonging the, the, the lifespan of, of any, any apparel item. Uh, and we are actually quite advanced with some of those corporations. I cannot mention the names yet, but it's, I can just confirm that there is definitely a need on, so on the business side, which we support a lot. And I'm talking, of course, about the, the, the more expensive items, which I think we would really like to support because we know that if someone invests a lot of money into their handbag of, of pair of high heels, they will surely use them for longer. Whereas the, the cheap apparel is usually used just once before it lands somewhere at the bottom of the wardrobe and that's definitely something we would like not would not support because that's just just terrible for from the environmental point of view so the, these are the, i think the two subjects both the consumer behavior but also the the big brands the uh, big names uh, behavior and strategy and it looks like we are all more and more in line here uh, and i think again the, the 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 current situation probably even accelerate those uh, processes yeah Thank you so much, everyone. I'm conscious of time and we've <laughs> eaten already the Q&A uh, part uh, a little bit. So um, yeah, it was a great discussion and, uh, and uh, I've really enjoyed getting uh, everyone's point of view and everyone's angle when it came to uh, the, the, this crisis, the, the digitalization, the, the transformation of uh, of the new consumer that is less and less consuming, but more active in the way they are choosing to uh, to own things or to share them. So uh, Zin uh, from the team will help us today with the Q&A. So anyone who wants to share a question or ask the, the panelists a question, please feel free to, to do so. Um, so uh, the first question would be uh, for you, Hasna. So um, what would be your recommendation or tips for people that would like to adopt a more sustainable lifestyle, but don't know how and how can they start? Yeah, uh, I think the first uh, step is to just see what, what you have, see, try to understand your habits, try to understand the way you are, your lifestyle and, and uh, identify what are the, 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 the points that trigger the more uh, unhealthy or unsustainable uh, things in, in your day-to-day -day, uh, life. 
it's definitely not the most pleasant thing to do or the easiest thing. It's quite actually painful to go through everything you have in your wardrobe and to try to understand why you put that, why you 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 are not wearing those things and uh, and see uh, kind of made, make an audit of what you have. Um, it's the first thing uh, to do when it comes to sustainability and then try to, to get creative with, uh, with what you can do with these items that you are not wearing or with machines that were maybe not, not working anymore or pushed uh, in the back of a cupboard. So yeah, uh, the uh, first assessment is always the, the, the first step to, uh, towards sustainability. And then just educate yourself around, uh, around tips on, or ways to, to change your habits uh, in, the, in your daily life. So for example, instead of buying new, why don't you uh, try to create creatively a new, um, a new, a new outfit or uh, try a new skill. So uh, during confinement, I'm sure everyone, uh, I know that the team has been uh, learning embroideries and, uh, and things like that. So um, yeah, kind of retrospective is, uh, is the first tip that I would uh, give to, to anyone wanting to start sustainability. Thank you. So the second question would be for you, Kat. Uh, so it's regarding the challenges uh, people face when adopting sustainable behaviors and how big is the gap between the intentions of change to a more sustainable lifestyle and the actual uh, actions people would take uh, to adopt this sustainable lifestyle. So I think this is something that we see frequently in the literature around this attitude behavior gap and that People frequently say that they want to be sustainable or more mindful or more circular in their thinking. However, their actions don't always align with that. And whilst I think that is widely established, I think we also have to look for the opportunities within that. So from a business perspective, are there innovations and disruptions that can happen to help people more closely align the two? Um, and I think, sustainability is frequently badged as not being easy and I think where we're getting to is that there has to be interventions in that space to make a sustainable lifestyle easy accessible convenient as we've touched on today and I think that's where the real opportunity for businesses but also for consumers to actually walk the talk and to think about what are the incremental changes that they can make in their own life that help them to move towards being more sustainable? And as Hasna says, that initial reflection piece around why we buy what we buy and what we do with it, I think is so important and so informative on an individual perspective um, before we even start to widen that out and to think about the impact on others and on the planet. I think taking that individual reflection especially with clothing, it's, it's so emotive. We buy, we buy things when we have a good day, we buy things when we have a bad day. And trying to understand our behaviours more, I think is a really important first step. Thank you. So the last question would be for Paul and Ludovic, and uh, I will link that to interesting answers from our polls. So, um, in the question, uh, what are the elements that prevent you from repairing your clothes? Uh, the answers were, I don't know where to go and I do not have time for it. And no one answered, I prefer buying something new. And the answer to, uh, if you're not used to repairing your clothes, would you be more willing to do it thanks to the digitalization of service? So everyone answered yes. So the question to both of you would be regarding uh, the main challenges um, that you encountered when you launched uh, your service uh, from physical uh, services to digital services. Well, you want so to for Paul and Ludovic. Go, go ahead, Ludovic. <laughs> yeah. um, I think it's interesting that people say, I wouldn't know where to go. And I think this is really the key sometimes because uh, as you say, it's a trade that uh, went from very, very little stores in the corner of a street by someone with a, a high degree of craftsmanship, but um, little experience in making their services known. And uh, um, when we launched, so we started as well with store, but we can see that uh, often consumer 
I say, I don't know that it can be done. So I've got you know, a jumper with leather clutches here. Uh, mm -hmm. If you have your elbow, which is broken, you say, oh, I could put some uh, leather patches and repair it. So it's the knowledge that this can be done and where to go. And I think it's the major challenge that all online businesses have because until someone Googles you uh, or finds you online through some sort of PR, they won't find you. So that's why we also believe that the physical element is important. And that's why also for us, we believe that partnering with brands is very important. Uh, we of course have an online presence and people can find us um, and tend to find us, but partnering with brands to be the, the reference for aftercare is paramount for us. And that's why we work very much with, with B2B, with fashion brands, because our goal is that whenever you buy a nice uh, pair of cloth from uh, any uh, you know, good quality brand, I don't mention name, they would sell and say, here's the piece of clothing. I'm happy to make a sale today, but I want you to have a nice experience throughout the life of this garment, cherish it and go to Blanc for the next 10 years. So the partnerships for us are, are going to be paramount uh, as we grow. Yeah, and I think I think it is not much for me to add because the questions were already answered. So the biggest barrier, the largest challenge was basically the awareness. Uh, you know, it's great to run business in a place like London when you have, you know, the, it's very international. It's a huge city, huge amount of customers. And you think, okay, I just opened the website and I will have 65 million potential customers coming to me. But that's the whole challenge. People are really bombarded with various news and ads everywhere. You know, it can be a social media page, it can be newspaper uh, under, underground where they jump into the train, full of full of different information. And it's really difficult to go through that noise and actually sell the sustainability. So that's that's the main challenge, I think. That's also the main barrier for for developing this and for having this trend actually accelerated. People just don't know where to go and how to do so. Those kind of panels we are just <laughs> organizing today, I think it's definitely a good step to create this awareness. Hopefully it will trigger some more questions, which we all will be more than happy to answer. And I think it's just a just step-by-step approach to, to, to promote it every time we, have, we see an opportunity both, both online and offline. And I think this awareness over time will spread and that's, that's probably the, 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 the best way forward. And to echo on that, thank you for, uh, I mean, Basically, the partnership by platforms like Save Your Wardrobe is also fantastic. I mean, just simply said, uh, this right. webinar is important, but also what you do on a daily basis is raise awareness for people that they can do it and giving them the tech. So uh, we are here, you know, a bit in the background and doing doing some craftsmanship, but you are on a, on a very large scale uh, raising the awareness and making sure people know and know where to go. So uh, I think uh, you're being a very big colibri. Uh, but it's, uh, so spreading that word and enabling people to to make the right choice. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. On that note, a very poetic note. Thanks to Ludovic. <laughs> uh, I'll encourage actually everyone attending to to take a look at Repair Week London Recycle com slash Repair Week. I think this is uh, the the um, the link for for it and uh, make sure to subscribe to the to everyone uh, social media channels uh, so Blanc Living uh, Shoes Spa London and University of Glasgow obviously uh, and take a look at the the other uh, panels and events that London Recycle has uh, prepared. Um, feel free to reach for us if you have uh, any other question outside of this panel but until then thank you so much everyone for attending and i wish you a very nice uh, week thank you thank you very thank much you, Hasna. bye everyone thank bye. you bye bye